Today is Sunday, April 23rd, 2017, and this is episode 189 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me today, as always, is Mr. Andrew Callett. Hello, Jerry. How are you, sir? I am super. How are you? I am doing very well, thanks. Can you believe two weeks in a row? It's almost like a trend. It's almost a trend. That's right. (laughs) So, um, Well, if you just weren't so damn important to your company... Maybe we'd have more time. That's obviously it, yes. You, you were, I mean, I'm pretty sure that if it weren't for you, your company would collapse in, in sc- screaming, terrified, r- people running in the streets, balls of fire, I think. Yes. Or, Based on your, on your schedule and your workload, that appears to be the case. <laughs> One would think, yes. Uh, well. I'm, I'm not nearly that important. <laughs> I have plenty of free time. I think I'm just crazy, but anyway, (laughs) that's a good segue into the thoughts and opinions we express on this show are ours and do not represent those of our employers. So, um, so yeah, it has been busy, continues to be busy, but you know, sometimes that's better than the alternative. That is true. So anyhow, uh, welcome back to the show and we're going to jump into some stories. So the first one I have for this evening comes from Ars Technica, and the title is Tanium CEO Admits Using Real Hospital Data in Sales Demos. Mm, mm -mm. Yeah. This is one of those that I really gets under my skin. Yeah. And and I keep keep hoping that there's something else that's going to come out to make it better. (laughs) <laughs> well, so it's it you know it, I'll tell you after having read a couple of articles about this, it's really not clear w- exactly what data was was disclosed and when, right? So so allegedly um uh, Tanium for some period of of time that that period of time has not been disclosed from what I I can tell, but apparently ended in 2015. Uh Tanium had been using as part of their their customer demos, uh, a, a console at the El Camino Hospital in California, uh-huh. and and so it's been said that there's you know there there was confidential data you know that that was being shown to prospective Tanium customers, but again, it's not entirely clear exactly what uh, you know what what was disclosed because there, there's some discussion that this was part of a test environment at the hospital. And and then there's other, there's other indications that it might actually be production, but then the hospital came out and said that they're, they're, you know, while they're shocked, no customer or no patient data was exposed. Well, yeah, of course they're going to protect their butt on that one. Well, sure, but you know, the, 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 this is something I, I think that we, especially with the newer companies, you have to be really careful. Well, I think what so reading between the lines, I think what happened was Tania made a deal with El Camino to give them discounted or free services and software in exchange for setting up some sort of anonymized or uh, abstracted demo with their environment. And I think what might have happened, in fact, there, there's a quote in the story here where they're talking about um, ours has learned from a source familiar with the installation that the company did, in fact, use a connection to El Camino Hospital's on premise instance of the Tanium Web Console for demonstrations. The connection would have had to have been provided by El Camino's information technology staff. I'm going to pause there. That makes sense, right? Because how else could they get in to do the demos? True. It's not like Tanium automatically phones home with all that data. It's not cloud run. So that makes sense that they had to get into the to the management council. Continuing, though it is not clear how far up the hospital's administration that arrangement was approved and the ar- arrangement was apparently never documented. Since 2015, about the time Tanium lost access to the El Camino Hospital installation, 
Titanium has required that these sorts of arrangements be codified in writing. Well, that makes sense. So I'm wondering if this was a sloppy early company, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours that got out of hand. It, it certainly, I mean, what you just read certainly makes it sound that way that, you know, may, maybe there was really no, you know, nothing suspicious going on here. It just wasn't documented and, and, and maybe well, the people and I, who agreed to it initially are, are gone. Right. Yeah. Because the, the customer, El Camino Hospital definitely came out initially saying this was not approved and not allowed and we're no longer a customer of Tanium and this is unacceptable and it's almost like El Camino starting to walk that back a little bit. Right. Um, and saying, but, so, I'm going to use this as a sidestep slightly to, to another. I worked in sales engineering for over 10 years with a lot of big and small InfoSec vendors. And I've seen so many times that sales reps would not, in the least bit be worried about the privacy or confidentiality of other customers. They would name drop all day long with prospects. And a non-disclosure agreement was not really treated as a non-disclosure agreement. It was treated as a qualifier for customer intent. In other words, we'll go ask that customer for a non-disclosure agreement. If they're going to go through all the legal paperwork, it means they're really interested in working with us. But once you had a non-disclosure agreement, I'd still catch sales reps talking about that customer to other customers. Right. And and I just don't think salespeople value the confidentiality of this stuff. I don't think it's I, I think they think it's it's silly. It's in their way. It's it doesn't help them get a deal done, so they're not going to worry about it. True. And 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 uh, what I've seen is is even even where they 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 pay lip service, I guess is the way I'll say it to the the non-disclosure agreements by, you know, effectively telling the entire story. But just not saying the specific name, but you know any right. any you know sufficiently smart person can you know usually guess a large soda pop manufacturer based in Atlanta. <laughs> right, exactly that sort of thing. A major airline based in Atlanta. Hmm, who could that be? Right. right. So, so uh, you do. I guess the point is, and by the way, we saw this with um, you know with some of the incident response companies, you know, in in the wake of Sony and some of the others, right where. Mm-hmm. Where their uh, where their, their sales teams had kind of blabbed <laughs> to other customers, and you know that's that's a real. Um, you know, the, by the way, as, as security people, we should be really attuned to our vendors doing that, right? I mean, if yeah. if a vendor comes in and starts talking to you about, you know, what happened over at Coke or, you know, <laughs> at the large soda maker in in uh, <laughs> in Atlanta, you know, think about what they're gonna possibly be saying about your company absolutely to other customers so you know you 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 want to you want to be aware of that i think well and here's the interesting thing sales reps in general try to establish a quote-unquote relationship with their customer and so there's a concept thrown around colloquially called a friend da which is sort of a i'm sharing this with you because you're my friend but understand that this is confidential information Right. Don't repeat it. Well, th- I could sort of make a case that there's a psychological concept of I'm sharing something secret with you to build a bond. Well, sure. Right. You know, and, and that's a, a relationship building technique that some salespeople will use. I, but yeah, it, you're right. But we, we we should be taking this stuff far more seriously. And I think it's a big deal. I, I really do. It makes me very uncomfortable if my security technology is being talked about without my knowledge and permission. Right. We 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 have a a friend of the show who was in a professional services team, uh, and he was on a scoping call. I'm not going to say who or what. And and uh, the sales rep who had teed up the scoping call had mentioned that they had done big installs at other big companies, which they're not supposed to do. And then when the professional services engineer gets on the phone, they start peppering with questions about that install. And rightly so, the professional services rep says, "I'm not. I can't talk about that." And then the sales rep gets upset. <laughs> Right. Internal struggle. Yep. Right. Uh, So all that to tee up to say 
this seems shady on Tanium's part, but there clearly was some sort of nod and wink agreement at some point. Right. But I think it probably went way too far. And I think I think El Camino probably gave Tanium an inch and they took a mile. Yeah, it's 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 really difficult to say. If it, you know if it was a demo environment, maybe it wasn't a big deal, but I mean, I it doesn't make sense why you would host a demo environment at a hospital. Uh, I, that part I don't get. So, well, uh, and I think, I think Tanium agreed to anonymize the data, and didn't do a good job of doing that. Yeah, that could be, that could be. But you know, I, I guess the, uh, the you know the 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 lesson here is to to really understand to the to the extent you can. Obviously, you you don't always know, right? But understand, uh, you know where. And how your vendors are gonna uh, are gonna use stuff like this. And and by the way, I know that in particular, new companies will often strike deals with or newer companies, new, newer vendors will strike deals with um, you know with with customers kind of all, of all sizes. You know if they're if they're willing to be a reference or provide right. information, right? You know we'll give you a big discount or maybe something for free or. What have mm-hmm. you, and you know you need to be cognizant of how that's how that's going to play out and make sure your management's aware that that's actually happening if yeah. you, if you do sign up for that sort of thing, you know it might you may end up in the headlines and you don't want to you really don't want to be the i t manager who agreed to this, and you know your <laughs> the head of your company is being contacted by some uh, some media person. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing that I do want to share, though, that was a quote uh, from the hospital quote uh, spokesperson came out, I think, maybe Friday. Quote, El Camino Hospital was recently made aware that Tanium, a former third-party vendor that provided a desktop management program, had been using hospital desktop and server management information as part of a sales demonstration. El Camino Hospital was not aware of this usage and never authorized Tanium to use hospital material in any sales material or presentation. El Camino Hospital is thoroughly investigating this matter and takes the responsibility of maintaining the integrity of its system very seriously. It is important that Tanium never had access to patient information and, based on our views today, patient information remains secure. It kind of goes against the uh, the whole deal of, of Tanium having access to that yeah, I don't know what, you know, I don't know where the truth lies anymore. If I had to take a guess, I bet it was a previous uh, IT executive who's probably no longer with the company. Yep. It's the only thing that makes sense. But we don't know for sure. But, you know, and this also kind of goes to, to startups sometimes get a little loosey-goosey when they got sales to get. Aggressive, yes. Yeah. That's right. You know, something to watch out for, though. You never know. And I think, you know, this could be made even worse now that we're getting more and more into cloud-based services. Oh, that's a that's a really good point. So where the, the management infrastructure for your security stuff is basically cloud-hosted. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a good point. So, Continue. Uh, caveat emptor. All right, so our next story comes from Hot for Security, which is Bitdefender's blog. And the title here is 95% of enterprise risk assessments find employees using Tor private VPNs to bypass security, report says. So, um, and this is, uh, this kind of resonated with me because I've seen this going back as far as I can remember in my IT career. Oh, yeah. And, and, um, so you know, basically, the the point is that almost every organization has this to some extent, and the the net point of the report is that your uh, well, the employees of the average company will you know really test the boundaries and f- trying to, trying to find a way to do their otherwise banned stuff or or you know, evade uh, what what they perceive as. Uh, as controls or monitoring of of their activity, and and so, you know, that's. By the way, you know, the, we had the um, the APT ten thing a couple of weeks ago, right? And one of the, you know, one of the the indicators of compromise was a VPN connection, right? You know, it was like a, it was a v- connection to a VPN provider, and there was a lot of hoopla about that. But you know, 
that's it was a commercial VPN provider, and so right. So you know that you don't know if it's legitimate or if it's being used for malicious purposes or maybe both. And then Tor, we know Tor is a, is you know has both legitimate and very concerning uses. And and I would say in the average, the the context of the average employee, there's really no good reason uh, for accessing Tor in a business well, context, right? They, they, they clearly would disagree. Well, obviously they would, but you know, point is you, you prob- those are, these are things that you may want to think about blocking if, if this is a concern to you. Yeah. Well, this goes fundamentally to, are you controlling your outbound traffic on your environment? Yes. And, and we have traditionally in the past 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever, focused on inbound traffic at our perimeters and limiting what comes inbound. But most people let just about anything out. And it's much more complicated and difficult to know what should get out and what shouldn't. But this is part of the reason why. Exfiltration of data, whether it's maliciously or, or otherwise, is is on the rise. And is always it's always going to be a factor. If you're limiting what your folks can do, there's always going to be some subset of the users in your environment who are, who are IT savvy enough to try ways around it. Right. And you can kill two birds with one stone. If you can spot that behavior, you may also be able to, should also be able to spot when some sort, sort of malware is also establishing some sort of outbound uh, encrypted session that you're not permitting, that you're not managing. Right. You know, in Absolutely. theory. Now, there's a, you know, a lot of different ways to, to, to slice that onion to solve that problem. Uh, you know, whether it's you're forcing everything to go through a proxy and you, and you intercept the TLS connections and then, you know, block the stuff you can't intercept or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But fundamentally, it's controlling your egress. Right. But this goes back also to another psychological point, which is that employees see security controls as in the way. Right. And if they can find a way around it to, quote, unquote, do their job or do their stuff or whatever, they likely will, at least some percentage of your, of your users. Absolutely. And we have a the next story talks actually goes into that a little more. Mm-hmm. So, so the, in this this particular report, which was from a company called Detex Systems, I don't never heard of them before. Um, they they indicate that of, in, in their analysis, sixty percent of attacks are committed by insiders, and of those, sixty eight percent were the result of negligence, twenty two percent were the result of malicious activity, and then another ten percent the result of credential theft. It was. You know, I I would have thought credential theft would have been a little higher, but yeah, just my experience. They said eighty seven yeah. percent of uh, of employees use personal email on work devices. Now that you know, I this by the way is a big problem. I have seen this quite often, where if you allow people to have access to um, you know to Gmail or some other personal email account. You know, there it, it is not unheard of for people to email confidential documents to themselves or to other people outside of the you know the, the work email system, and that is. And but why would they typically do it? Because they're being malicious, or because they want to work on it at home, and your security controls are in the way, or I think it's both. Okay. You know, to, to be quite honest, I think it's both. And in now that that's from an outbound perspective, but from an inbound perspective, there's also a big problem, right? That if if your email, your inbound email uh, scrubbing is 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 you know mature. Let's say you have a FireEye or or something like that on your on the edge of your network. It's not looking at attachments that are coming through somebody's Yahoo email, right? And and so you're reliant solely on the workstation controls. Agreed. Though the the longer <laughs> the way things are going, it looks like we may have to focus more on the workstation controls anyway. Oh, I I do agree, but but yes, y- you are bypassing a lot of your network uh, base controls if if you do that. Yep. They uh, they go on to say that um, you know that there are still bad behaviors going on in uh, in offices. They were fifty nine percent of 
the organizations in their survey had found people using or surfing porn and 43% either betting on uh, sports sports games or uh, online lotteries, <laughs> which is really <laughs> crazy. Uh, and then there was another interesting thing, in, which, which, you know, in, ref, in re- retrospect, this is, by the way, in the, um, I think it's in the, more in the actual report than in the, the post I, I include in the, in the links here. They, they point out that data theft by an employee is most prevalent during the first two weeks of their employment and the last two weeks of their employment. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. right? Which the first two weeks you could more easily keep an eye on. The last two weeks is tough. Yeah, because you don't know when it starts. You don't know. <laughs> right. You don't always know when, know when the last two weeks starts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an issue. You know, and this is one where it starts to, you know, this is where now all the marketing comes out of the woodwork of, well, this is why you have to protect your data. You know, wrap your data with digital rights management. and Because yeah, that works for smaller companies, right? Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, it's a tough one. So I, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't agree with these stats. I, I think probably if we dug into the, the, the methodology behind these, the survey, it's probably pretty weak. But uh, I do think that it's a real issue, and I do think that they bring up a real issue. But I think these stats are probably not close to accurate. Well, I, I would say they may be accurate as they, as far as a representation of their customer base. But I'm not sure their customer base is an accurate representation of the average. Right company, so that's something to keep in mind. But it does it does go back to exactly what we said, which is that depending on how somebody is incentivized and how they're managed and how they're led, they may have business goals that are impeded by security controls. Yep. And when that happens, typically they're going to try to find a way around those security controls. Right. And probably without much negative consequence. Because most folks don't get fired over this stuff. True, that's certainly true, and and a lot of times you don't know about it until much later. Right, and you're doing like a post mortem or or whatnot on a, on a situation. Right, and you know if <clears throat> in the case of um, you know let's say in the case of of taking confidential data in the last two weeks of your employment, if you after you've resigned and they realize that, what are they going to do? You know, that's right. It's it's a pretty drastic I, I step to to unless they're to willing to spin up a lawsuit, right? Exactly, and a lot of people, a lot of companies aren't. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess unless there's a lot of there's a lot at stake, I suppose they will. But for the most part, companies don't like to air this kind of laundry. Yeah, so agreed. That that takes us to our next story, which comes from CSO Online, and it's about another survey. The title here is. Most employees willing to share sensitive information, survey says. So this was a survey uh, funded by Dell. Oh, and by the way, that, that last company, uh, the, the, the company that f- sponsored that, you know, they, of course, have some solutions that will help you out with all of those. No. Pro- I no. know. I know. It's crazy, right? No. It's completely coincidental. <laughs> I. <laughs> uh, anyway. It's I'm just not an old and cynical. Well, really. I'm probably not helping. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you are not. So, um, so a couple of interesting stats in here. Seventy-two uh, percent. They, they found that seventy-two percent of employees were willing to share confidential information. And interestingly, in the area, in the financial services sector, they found that it was higher at eighty-one percent. Uh, even though that sixty-five percent said they knew it was the responsibility to protect that confidential information. Ouch. Um, now there was Which, another. Oh, go ahead. It, it's really interesting that financial services are are higher. I, yes, I found that very interesting because that's one group that typically spends a lot on employee training on Correct. this area. Right. Hmm. Uh, so the, another interesting stat: uh, employee. Uh, it's a quote. Employees also felt the company's security policies were getting in their way, in the way of them doing their jobs. With seventy six percent saying that they're employers prioritize security over productivity. Yep. As as we've mentioned on the last couple of it's like a theme. It's a theme show this week. A, it is a theme show. But I think I think that's a very accurate perception. But where I think this is falling down is employers are not doing a good enough job explaining to the employees why that trade-off is useful and important. 
true or well and or giving them um you know, secure alternatives to yeah, do things. That, right, yeah. right. Yeah, you can't just take away a functionality that they need to get their job done without providing them some sort of reasonably useful secure functionality to to continue. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, you can't tell people, you know, you need to go work. You need to, you know, you need to work a hundred hours a week. You don't have to do it all here. But by the way, you can't access the data if you're not here. Right. <laughs> you know, so Is, they're going to find about- a way. Are we talking about your personal situation now, Jerry? No, 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 we're not. (laughs) I would never, ever violate a policy, ever. Because if their job or their success at their job is in conflict with security, they're going to go with what they need to do to get their job done. Well, in, in, in general, most employees and most employers don't have a construct where your performance is evaluated based on how you adhere to company policy. Particularly right. if there's no good way to detect that you violated customer pol- or uh, the, the company, company policy, um, it, you know. It, whereas you are graded on your output. Yeah, that's very true. And and so you 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 have this you have this incentive model where it's almost guaranteed that people are you know if if there's a conflict, productivity is always going to win. Unless you build controls and policy and process around it, yeah, right. That's you right. know, and and make it that important. It, it also depends on how much that policy is truly enforced and bought into by leadership. There's a whole bunch of cultural stuff that you can have a policy that's completely unenforced and un, un you know, has no teeth. Right. That's it's true. it's a very interesting problem. But I I, I remember one role I was I, I was. <sighs> How can I, I need to tell the story without violating anything? Um, I was briefing the results of a penetration test to a bunch of folks who normally don't see that information. And one of the comments I got back was, no one has ever explained to us, they were non-security folks, really even sort of not even IT folks, but no one, one of their comments was, no one has ever explained to us why all this security crap we go through matters. Yeah. In terms of, no one had ever laid it out for me before as to this is how a bad guy can hurt our company. Right. It's not real to them. Um, and, and, you know, there's always going to be some percentage of, the, of, of your organization that just will never buy in, no matter how much you try to explain to them and how much you share with them. You know, so there still has to be technical controls. There still has to be enforcement of certain policy if it's important enough to your company. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times these policies are put in place as a after the fact we can point to it not actually enforced in normal life kind of thing. Right. So so I- interesting segue into a, another set of stats. So g- going on to quote um see the, in the first this this is the first year of the survey blah 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 but having seen other research I don't think that the number is increasing uh in in the more and more companies are conducting uh, conducting security training. However, of those who received training, 18% were still making bad security decisions because they didn't realize they were doing anything wrong, and 24% did it knowing it was wrong because they wanted to get their job done. Right? So so um yeah, you know, we have a, qu- a quarter of people are saying that they will they they have violated company policy where it it, you know where where they've had to because they needed to get their job done. Interesting. Now then they go on to say it's, it, it gets worse. A, well, a little worse, right? So then they go on to say that one surprising re- this is the quote one surprising result of the survey was that when it came time to inappropriately sharing confidential information, those who received the training were actually more likely to do it. Seventy three percent versus sixty two percent. I. I would no. love to know more about why. I actually cover that, right? So it's, mm-hmm. um, there's, there, is a, there is a reason, and this is one of those things. I'm super glad they put this in the story because, um, you know. You, because you read a book on this, you would tell us about it? Yeah, I, but yeah. I'm not going to because they, they cover it right here. Oh, well, good. 
Well, so the survey results do show that required secu- cybersecurity training goes hand in hand with increased tendencies toward information sharing. This is an unintuitive finding for us. However, we should emphasize that this is correlation, not necessarily ca- causation. For example, there may be other factors involved. For example, that's really bad English. The companies where employees engage in risky behaviors may be more likely to have security training. Ah. Uh-huh. Right? So... It's not that, necess- that makes sense. It's not necessarily, it's not a indictment well, you, of security training. Like if you train right. your people, they're more likely to go out and do bad stuff. So to truly know if that's the case, you would have to have a company that you can, you took these stats with no security training for a period of time, then introduced security training and took these stats again for a period of time. Yeah, even, that, even some, that would be problematic. Well, this is why I'm not a st- statistician. <laughs> I, I suck at coming up with good... Yeah, you it, know. It, it it this is a it's a really difficult thing to test. But by the way, you know, so so kind of going back but, to a book, right? But kudos to this article for throwing that in because a lot of people will do that. Yeah, going going back to one of the thousands of books you read last week. Correct. So so a bunch of books I, I've I've read recently have have all brought up this this point about um, the scared straight program. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Right. Yeah, nope. I watch it on TV all the time because nothing, nothing makes me happier than watching some punk nosed bully kid get scared by a lifer con. <laughs> right. So, so for those who are uh, who are unaware, right, the, the scared straight program was uh, it was an intervention for for teenagers here in the U.S. and it eventually spread kind of across the world, where um, you know, where rather than going to jail, they could be opted into this. To, to the scared straight program and the idea was they they would take uh the, the state or the city or county whatever would take a group of of these troubled teenagers through a prison and and the you know on on the prison side like the um you know the the, the prisoners would volunteer for, so this was kind of like a uh you know, almost like a job for them, right? So they, they had to apply for it and blah, 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 right? Anyway, the idea was that the prisoners were, were intended to, you know, to talk to the, these teenagers and tell them how horrible it is to be in prison and how much they hate it. And well, and also for them to see bits and pieces of the, the prison lifestyle and the shock that it is. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and in the, uh, you know, in the end, all of this, uh, there's lots of data collected and whatnot and, and, you know, everybody, well, most everybody thought it was just a huge success. And it, like I said, it, it went across the world. It just took the world by storm. This was back in the seventies and eighties, maybe even into the nineties. And eventually some sociologists kind of took a look at it. I don't remember exactly where they were from, but I don't think it was the U S and they, so they grew, they ruined our fun, They ruined the fun because they found out that people who go through the teenagers who go through, um, scared straight were more likely to commit crimes but did are they only going through scared straight because they already had that tendency anyway no no so they did randomized control trials where they where they assigned some to scared straight and some to, to not and then if you compared them you know 10 years down 10 years later or whatever right the people who went scared straight were sig- statistically significantly more likely to commit crimes and they don't wow. they don't really know exactly why that is. I mean, there's some hypothesis that says, you know, maybe it's because they thought they were, you know, they went in there and they had to prove the to unknown. themselves that it was. Yeah, there was the unknown. It's not unknown anymore. Blah. So anyway, right. no good. But point is, the intuition, like this had to, this had a strong intuition. Like, you know, few people would have doubted this worked. It just intuitively seems really sensible. But it isn't. And so that's the kind of thing that you have to be really careful when you... When you and we have things. a ton of that in our industry, by the way. Yeah, yeah. We have a ton of that. And it causes massive debate over and over again. And and I think part of it is because most of the folks who are driving the narrative around this have an incentive model for whatever that is. Let's, let's pick on... Uh, I don't know. Let's pick on employee awareness training just for a moment. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it works or doesn't work. But let's, let's use phishing training. Everyone is bought in. I shouldn't say everyone. Most people are bought into the concept that if you train your users to avoid phishing, it helps. 
But any stat around that typically comes from people who sell fishing training. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> so, so how do I, if I'm truly taking a scientific and, and sociological and statistical view of this, know if it really helps or not? It, I, I don't have any good non-biased third-party data. Really, that, that's true. You, you really don't. I mean, there isn't a there isn't a good way to tell um, it, in a in a in a valid way. I don't. In my my view. Well, I'll put it this way: there may be out there, but I can't easily find it. Like there, there could be somebody screaming at their podcast playing device, like, "Yeah, that's what I do for a living, you idiots!" So, I apologize if there is somebody yeah. out there doing this. You just but, on Twitter if you do. <laughs> Yeah. We'd love to talk about it, yes. But but this is something we rant about from time to time, that the majority of folks educating the market about Topic X are the ones who sell Topic X. Right. So right. how can you trust it? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a perverse incentive right there. And, but it, it's, it's on the buyer, it's on the consumer to own that. There's nothing wrong with a marketing team to market and you know say what it... But, but we... We listen. We buy into it. That's on us. Yeah, but e- 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 you're right. You're right. But how? Back you know. into the exact snake oil days where people said, this tonic made from rare herbs from India will cure this entire list of things. And, and, and eventually, you know, that worked for a long time. And eventually we, as a society and as people, at least in, in the West, got enough of our own intuitive knowledge to be able to see through those scams and it seems like we're not at that point in the cybersecurity world no you're definitely right and and part of the reason is i think because it's those same people who who are fully bought into their own the effectiveness of their own product and so they may not they not they may very well not be doing anything overtly malicious because they they truly do think that it helps but not only are they standing out on the street selling their elixir right they're Mm -hmm. also writing the stories and the reports in all the stuff we read right or hiring the company to run the report to run the survey to write the report yes right so it's um you know, it's the the, which they control the whole full ecosystem here (laughs) which gets off into that whole av testing debate that we'll probably cover next show right. of that entire world you know having a civil war right now because of this exact question right so uh so there's a there's a new word that i want everybody to take away it's called aruspicy and I, I'm, I'm i'm saying that this is cyber aruspicy and if you want to well i don't know if i should tell you what it means or not it's 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 reading goat entrails Okay, and that's that's basically where we're at with uh, cybersecurity. This 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 show has taken a weird turn. I wasn't expecting. Good, good. I good. was not anticipating horizon, <clears throat> horizon expanding right here. I think I think I was not prepared to discuss good entrails today. Okay, I, th- I think you got to warn a man before you bring that up. I think that should have been in was, the show. It notes. was uh, it was it was it was a shocker. So anyway. Let's move on to our last story. I don't know that I can. I think I might just be done. <laughs> I've got to reboot and start over. You you can't just drop goat entrails on, on a co-host like that, buddy. <sighs> okay. This isn't Vegas. Well, that's true. All right. Next story. Last story. So this one, uh, this one comes from bleepingcomputer.com, and the title is over 36,000 computers infected with NSA's double pulsar malware. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it's somewhere between a whole bunch and maybe none. We don't, you know, anyway. So so this goes back to what we talked about last week. There was the, you know, the, the shadow brokers dumped a bunch of stuff and there was a big panic that there were some zero days, but they weren't really zero days because Microsoft delayed the patch in February so they could patch them when they released the patch in March, but they didn't tell anybody until uh, last Friday or two weeks ago Friday that, that this was in, in fact patched. So, that, so, so there is a, uh, there's an exploit that was fixed by MS-17010 that, uh, that is used to implant this 
uh, well, it implant an implant to uh, to install this implant called double pulsar, and uh, and and so the way this th- this kind of mechanically works is uh, MS O one O or MS seventeen O one O is it's a vulnerability on the SMB port so port four port four four five right so if it's exposed to the internet TCP four four five right TCP four four five exposed mm-hmm. to the internet um, it's in, it, and is vulnerable right. This this exploit can you know, effectively install. You can can run some code, right? And they install this double pulsar implant. Now, the double pulsar implant is um, it's an ephemeral piece of malware. So so if you reboot the system, it goes away, right? But while it's active, uh, and it goes and, and just to be clear, it goes away because it's not dropping any files correct. whatsoever. It's it's merely embedding itself in a memory and staying in memory, but not doing anything it doesn't to keep do itself any- alive. Yeah, it, and it doesn't actually do anything on its own. It just sits there and listens, right? And so, so what it does is it it listens. So when, once once a system's been implanted with this double pulsar, it just sits there and listens for a special sequence of you know you basically the you know like port knocking kind of think of it that way right so if and you then, if you send it a good if you send it a you know certain sequence of characters you can you can effectively send it some co- commands that it, that the double pulse, pulsar implant will then execute so it's not doing anything other than uh you know kind of waiting for some commands which by the way is what the exploit of MS010 or MS17010 actually does too Right, so, um, <laughs> you know, the marginal is so. There's a lot of people right now scanning the internet frantically, trying to figure out, you know, a how many systems on the internet are listening on SMB. And by the way, that number is apparently, um, you know, drum roll, please. It's a little over five and a half million, I believe. Can't and how many of those are honeypots? Well, who knows, right? <laughs> That, by the way, that step blows my mind. That there's that many folks that either have have Windows boxes raw on the internet with four for five running, or are forwarding it through their firewalls. Correct. That is stunning to me. But I guess the stats are the stats. Yeah, and then they don't cover it in this particular. Um, but I got to think a good ten percent of that are honeypots. Yeah, so so it's it's really hard to tell, right? But yeah, um, so so the, the this this article doesn't cover it, but they some of the the stats I saw people like Dan Tetler and and um, and others talking about where they 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 believe they found somewhere around three hundred thousand hosts that were vulnerable to that hadn't applied the MS seventeen zero one zero patch, so they were they were vulnerable. And and then they went took another pass and they found that thirty six thousand. This is where the variation, the wide variation, comes in, right? Somewhere around thirty six thousand of those systems, allegedly, have been implanted with double pulsar. And and so the thinking is that, you know, after it was disclosed last Friday, you know, the the kids <laughs> downloaded it and started, you know, went to town. Um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of hand wringing and fretting going on oh, oh my god we've got 36,000 systems that are implanted with this piece of malware and that's not good but here's my concern right double pulsar as far as I can tell doesn't really buy you much beyond the actual vulnerability that you is used to get it there right because you in order to get double pulsar onto the system you you you, ha- you have to exploit the vulnerability, right? And the, and if it gets rebooted, like after it's been patched, it goes away. So it's not like once it's been implanted, it stays there, yeah. right? So so if you're going to install malware on the system through that vulnerability, you don't need this, right? So so to me, it's a red. The, the thirty six thousand number is a red herring. We should be worried about the bigger number of vulnerable systems. So anyway, that it. That's my that's my shtick here. So are, are I, you gonna I, are you going to go outside and yell at the cloud now? I am. I already <laughs> did. I already did actually. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, this is this is this kind of problem we've had from 
you know, like day five of the internet of unsecured hosts being run on the, on the net. And, and Jesus this is Christ, the big, 445 open. It's like, I, I don't, I, I'm trying to come up with a, an age appropriate analogy and I'm not coming up with one. Um, anyway, it's a really bad idea. It's a right. really, really, really bad idea. And damn it, patch. I, I really hope yeah. all five and a half million of these, by the way, are honeypots. But I don't think well, they are. And this is why I, I have sympathy for, for Microsoft's position of you know, like Windows 10 and such. We're just going to patch your ass whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, there's a part of me that bristles at that heavily. But the more I see this stuff, the more I'm like, eh, it's kind of the we've kind of pushed them into that corner. Mm hmm. You know, that 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 for their own reputation of having a secure operating system, they, they're they're going to have to auto patch. Uh, that comes with its own slippery slope and terrible consequences, and it'll be an interesting experiment to see how it works out. But I kind of get how we got here. Uh, yeah, but this is this is you know it's pretty bad. Um, they, they, by the way, so so the 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 way to think about this particular one, a lot of a lot of people. By the way, you know who, who doesn't have this particular problem? Linux, Linux. or Macs. Yep. Yeah. Or Mac, yeah. That's that's true. Same. That's true. My Android phone doesn't fall victim to this. <laughs> Just saying. It's the only thing that it doesn't fall victim to. Oh, 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 oh. Shots fired. Um, yeah. Or, so, 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 th- the way to think about this one is a lot of people remember Configure. Don't tell me how to think. Oh, I mean, go on, Configure. Yeah. Configure it exploited MS oh eight oh six seven back, you know, back in the day. Mm-hmm. And it's still, you know, Configure still is, you know, s- flares up on the internet every now and then. This is this is effectively very similar to Configure or or, or the vul- the vulnerability that Configure used. What if all the Configure uh, exploited hosts are really just honeypots set up to get exploited by Configure? It could be. <laughs> Could be. You don't know. When you do like a mass scan written by a friend of ours, Rob not a friend, Graham? but I, I guess I can call him a friend. I don't know if he calls me a friend. I call him a friend. But he doesn't Rob tell you Graham. to go away when you walk up to him. So, or right away at least. Well, uh, he does turn his back on me and sort of walk away on his own. Well, but not right away. No, that's true. Anyway, uh, he wrote a tool called MassScan, and it scans the internet very quickly for all sorts of crap. And it's amazing, the stuff that's out there. That yeah. It's just raw on the net. I, yep. I don't, I don't understand. But Honeypots are fun if you're looking for a project. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, patch your stuff. Get it done. Don't, don't expose Windows... SMB share, you know, SMB ports to the internet ever. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's a ter- I mean, I just can't express well, to, how bad of an idea this is. But Jerry, I need to RDP into my, my work desktop when I'm at home. You, well, you don't need SMB. I don't know. It's confusing. It just had Windows ports. I said yes. Any, any, any accept, right? right? All right. Well, that's, that's it. I, I, I'm done. I, Forever? I, I got to go and take a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tiring being an old man yelling at clouds. That's right. That's right. So, uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for listening to the show. And any, uh, any shout-outs or administrivia uh, you want to mention before we go? Absolutely. Um, well, so first off, um, DerbyCon tickets are, are going on sale. We'll let you know when to buy. So just, after we secure ours. Yeah, just just hang on until we tell you. <laughs> um, In all honesty, May 5th. <laughs> uh, be there, be square. I, I, I'm definitely intending to be there. I'll probably have to fly in from New York, but, um, you know, whatever. That's your jet-setting lifestyle. Yep. Um, let's see. And then uh, thank you very much to all the Patreon donors. Absolutely. You guys are awesome. That still blows my mind. And uh, thank you to all the uh, the great people that interact with me on Twitter and and uh, and you as well. And with that, uh, I don't have anything else. You? Uh, hey, the book I've been talking about's out. The uh, Defensive oh, yeah, Security that's Handbook. Right. That's right. Uh, 
not in any way related to the show, even though we have similar names. Uh, it's out on O'Reilly Press. But I was very fortunate and honored and humbled to write the forward. So don't hold that against the book. Otherwise, it's great. There, there's even a movement afoot to get you to uh, to do the audiobook, right? To narrate I, the audiobook. I don't know that that works out so well with technical books. Can you imagine trying to, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Like explain like I don't know, like a long sequel injection exploit code snippet verbally. Look, it's the audiobook. You just <laughs> you just do it. <laughs> oh, man. All right, next show I'm gonna come up with some examples I'll read for you and we'll talk about how well that goes. Okay. Anyway, the book's out. Uh, written by some good friends of the show. It's a it's a good, solid book. It covers all sorts of, of stuff. It's a good sort of primer for all sorts of different areas of InfoSec. So, um, you know, hardcore folks, been in the industry a long time, still may get a couple snippets out of it, but I see it really hitting well for folks who are trying to broaden their skill set into all different areas, and it gives you a good you know, good bite-sized chunk of many, many different areas of the industry. So I, nobody's paying me to say that. I'm not making any money off the book. Uh, they didn't pay me to write the forward. I just didn't just doing a shout they're, out. They're paying me. I I conned you. <laughs> <sighs> I kid. I kid. I kid. I always suspected. Uh, let's see what else. I may hopefully be at besides Knoxville, Tennessee, on May fifth. Actually, the same day that Derby. Oh, the same day Derby Con oh, goes on sale. Could be a problem. Mm. I'm hoping to be there. I've got a ticket. It's Friday. We'll see. Good deal. Otherwise, I think that's it. I think that's all the stuff I've got to mention. All right. Well, hopefully we'll make it three times in a row next week. Until then, have a great week. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.